few people viewing the prototype of the new Panzer IV in 1936 could have known that they were looking at the machine which, when upgraded in response to the contingencies of war, would become the workhorse of the German army throughout the Second World War. As originally envisaged, the role of the Panzer IV was that of a support tank. It thus played second fiddle to the smaller and lighter Panzer III, which was planned to provide the backbone of the new Panzer divisions being formed in the late 1930s. Events were to prove that it was fortuitous for the Wehrmacht that, in designing the Mark IV with the larger hull and turret ring, they had created a machine with development potential not available in its stablemate. In consequence, the more numerous Panzer III was rendered obsolete as a battle tank by the end of 1942, the role being inherited by the Panzer IV. Production of the Panzer IV was initially low, so while examples were frequently seen in military parades in Germany, just 211 had been built by the time Hitler gave the order for the invasion of Poland, with these tank crews and their Panzer IVs seeing combat for the first time on the morning of the 1st of September 1939. Although the Panzer IV performed well in Poland, it was revealed to be under-armoured, a limitation shared with all German tank types employed in the campaign. The side armour of the Mark IV had proven vulnerable to the Polish 40mm Bofors anti-tank gun. Polish gunners had been inadvertently aided by targeting the Panzers by the German use of high visibility white and yellow crosses and other tactical markings which stood out in marked contrast against the overall standard body colour of very dark grey and provided excellent aiming points. The lesson was rapidly learnt and many German tank crews obscured them by the liberal use of mud. Subsequently, the Model D, which came off the production line in October 1939, saw the thickness of the side armour increase from 15 to 20 millimetres. It had been Hitler's original intention to attack in the West as early as November 1939, but this date was cancelled, as were numerous others in the months ahead. Even though the winter of 1939-40 was extremely cold, the German army continued to prepare for the coming campaign. This footage, taken on training grounds in the east of the country, Panzer IVs exercise with infantry in their allotted role as support vehicles, functioning as the enemy for the benefit of troops equipped with the 37mm anti-tank gun. When on the 10th of May 1940 the Germans opened their offensive in the west, Panzer IV numbers had increased to 280 accounting for about one-ninth of the total number of 2,574 German tanks fielded in the campaign. While the relatively small increase of 69 machines in service since September 1939 continued to reflect the still low level of production of the machine, there were nevertheless sufficient available to ensure that every tank unit in the campaign would field a Panzer IV medium tank company of between 6 to 11 vehicles. The rapidity with which France was defeated owed more to the tactical and strategical employment of German armour acting in mass and in concert with the Luftwaffe to paralyse and confuse the enemy than it did upon the superiority of German tanks. When operating within the mass of German armour, the Panzer IV proved effective in its intended support role, but on those occasions when tank clashes did occur, its limitations came to the fore the low velocity of its 75mm gun proving unable to penetrate the heavy armour of either the French or British main battle tanks, the Char 1B Bis and Matilda II. Even as German tank units overhauled their machines in the wake of the French surrender and all eyes turned to the opening of the Luftwaffe's air campaign against Great Britain, Hitler had voiced his intention of attacking the Soviet Union in 1941. Hitler ordered planning for the new campaign on the presumption that the armoured formula used to defeat France could be employed with equal success in the East. Although this campaign must inevitably be greater in scope, no attempt was made to accelerate war output and especially tank production in anticipation. Blitzkrieg provided the ideal means for Hitler who wished to fight war on the cheap and not overstress the German economy. This is mirrored by Panzer IV production, just 322 being produced between July 1940 and May 1941, even though 223 of these comprised the up-armoured and improved Model E. 
When on June the 22nd, 1941, Hitler unleashed the Wehrmacht against the Soviet Union, the forces involved constituted the greatest land invasion in history. The cutting edge of the German drive eastward was the Panzerwaffe, tasked by Hitler to realize his primary requirement that the Red Army be destroyed in a rapid campaign in Western Russia before it could retreat into the depths of the country. On paper, the number of panzer divisions employed suggested that there had been a major expansion in the size of the tank arm. From a total of just 10 at the beginning of the French campaign, the army could now field 21 panzer divisions, of which 17 were committed to this new theatre of war. But, as we have seen, this expansion was not the consequence of increased production, but of a decision by Hitler in September 1940 to create new divisions by halving the size of the existing panzer divisions, reducing each to just one tank regiment and increasing the infantry component in compensation. This expedient went in the face of the accepted wisdom formulated in the 1930s, that to be fully effective, panzer divisions needed approximately 400 tanks. In 1940, the strongest panzer division had 300 tanks. Hitler's decision reduced the average strength of the 1941 panzer division to just 160 machines, which greatly lessened their effectiveness, in consequence laying the seeds for the ultimate failure of the tank arm in the wider war to come. Such considerations were not at all apparent as, in the three months following the opening of Operation Barbarossa, the German armoured divisions performed as expected. Thrusting rapidly and deeply into the Soviet hinterland, they netted vast numbers of Soviet prisoners and destroyed and captured colossal quantities of military equipment in great battles of encirclement. Of the total 3,322 panzers Hitler had committed to the invasion of Russia, just 438 were Panzer IVs. Although the numbers produced since the end of the French campaign were paltry, they nevertheless enabled each medium tank company to field at least 10 of these support tanks. It had not taken German tank crews or their superior officers very long to appreciate that the intelligence assessments of Soviet tank strength made prior to Barbarossa were far too low. Day in and day out, the Russians threw never-ending numbers of tanks against the Germans, in a desperate attempt to blunt the momentum of the panzer columns, slashing ever further eastward and deeper into Russia. Heinz Guderian had believed his pre-war assessment of the Soviet tank park at some 10,000 machines to be in all likelihood an overestimate. In reality, actual Soviet tank numbers was about double that figure. By far and away, the bulk of this Soviet armor was decidedly obsolescent, now shattered and hulked, T-26s, T-28s and T-38s and tanks of the BT series that littered the roads, ditches and fields along the routes of the German advance provided mute testimony to the effectiveness of the guns of the panzers in penetrating the very weak armour protection of these machines. Even in the low-velocity weapon of the Stubbs, as the crews of the Panzer IV called their machines, was able to defeat the armour of these Soviet machines with ease. But this was certainly not true of the encounter between the Panzers and the isolated examples of the new generation of Soviet armoured vehicles thrown into the melee by the Red Army commanders, desperate to slow the headlong rush of the German armour. German intelligence had given no indication of the existence of the KV-1, KV-2 or the superlative T-34. Although the sloped armour of the T-34 provided it with highly effective protection and the 76mm gun a powerful weapon, the effectiveness of this and the other two types was much reduced by the Red Army's poor handling of these invaluable assets. The Germans were thus able to compensate by employing their far superior tactical expertise, as in the case of Panzer IVs of 18th Panzer, who were able to defeat a T-34 by underrunning its fire weaving around the Soviet machine and shooting up its tracks, thus forcing its crew to abandon it. In most cases, T-34s and KVs were destroyed by the use of 88mm flat guns and artillery firing over open sights. But these expedients could not disguise the technical march the Russians had stolen and to which the Germans now had to respond. In August, Hitler shelved the drive on Moscow and ordered Guderian's second panzer group from Army Group Center to drive south and assist Army Group South in the encirclement and destruction of the massive Soviet concentration in and around Kiev. But the panzer divisions were already beginning to show the strain. 
Strength returns for the beginning of September indicated that over half of the tanks employed at the opening of Barbarossa were already lost or out of action. The inability to return broken down machines to service was due to an inadequate spare situation. This matter was compounded by Hitler's refusal to sanction release of new build tanks as replacements, preferring to hold them back to be used in the new panzer divisions being raised in Germany. On July the 8th, he agreed to release just 15 replacement Panzer IVs for Russia. Nevertheless, the subsequent junction of the Panzers of Guderian and Kleist on the 14th of September sealed both the Kiev pocket and the fate of five Soviet armies. 665,000 Russian troops died or were captured. With Army Group Center's flank now cleared, Hitler gave the green light for the resumption of the drive on Moscow. Even as the Kiev operation was concluding, far to the north German forces closed on the environs of Leningrad. The drive through the Baltic states by the two Panzer Corps provided for Army Group North had by the end of the first week of September found them poised to take the city. Hitler, however, had decided that it was not to be stormed but placed under siege. On the 12th of September, General Reinhardt received orders that his Panzer Corps was being pulled out of the line for re-employment elsewhere. The news caused consternation, as the decision just could not be understood. The panzers of Reinhardt Corps were entrained southward to join the assembling panzer concentrations in and around Smolensk. They were to participate in Operation Typhoon, the great offensive to capture Moscow and end the Russian campaign before the onset of winter. Around Leningrad, German artillery was sighted to initiate a barrage and a siege that was subsequently to last 900 days and lead to the death of a million and a half Soviet soldiers and citizens. Within a week of the opening of Operation Typhoon at the end of September, the German forces netted a further 663,000 Soviet prisoners in the twin battles of Vyazma and Bryansk, tearing open the front before Moscow. Little, it would seem, could now stop the Germans from taking the city, except perhaps the rigours of nature. In the north and centre of the front, the Germans discovered that the thick forests hindered the forward movement of the panzers. The weather began to change, and it was by the middle of October, dark for something like 14 hours in every day. In the south, Guderian's panzer grouper received a sharp shock on the 6th of October, when the Soviets attacked, employing the T-34 en masse for the first time and inflicted heavy casualties on the 4th Panzer Division. They did it again five days later, the Panzer IVs now being inhibited in their movement by the lack of grip of their narrow tracks in the muddy conditions that brought all forward movement to a halt. Bogged down by the mud, the Germans waited for the onset of the frosts, and the Russians, granted a breathing space of a fortnight, prepared to receive them. The advance resumed on the 15th of November in clear and frosty weather. The High Command and von Bock, seen here with Guderian, were still hopeful that Moscow could be taken. By the 1st of December, Bock had changed his mind, no longer believing success possible. Temperatures had plummeted and neither the soldiers in their summer uniforms nor the panzers and supporting vehicles were prepared for a winter campaign. Soviet resistance had begun to noticeably harden. Even so, the advance continued. As the temperatures began to plummet, frostbite cases among the infantry began to grow alarmingly. The tanks froze up overnight, guns could not fire as sights froze up. It was becoming very apparent that the German forces were close to the end of their tether.
Although these tank crew appear cheerful for the benefit of the cameramen, the condition of the panzer divisions was also declining rapidly. Although one last effort was being made, the prospect of seizing Moscow was rapidly fading, especially as it was becoming apparent that among the reinforcements flowing into the line before Moscow were units from Siberia. On December 3rd, the Germans had shot their bolt, and two days later, the Red Army went over to the counter-offensive. On the 15th of February 1941, the tanks and other vehicles of the newly arrived Africa Corps under General Erwin Rommel paraded through the streets of Tripoli before driving off into the desert to open up the campaign to tip the British out of Cyrenaica. Rommel's force was small, comprising initially the 5th Light Division with just 150 tanks, only 40 of which were Mark III's and 40 Panzer IVs. These were D and E models and were serving with the 5th and 8th Panzer regiments and issued with special tropical equipment, which included an air filter and larger radiator carried above the engine deck and protected by an armoured cover. The war of thrust and counter-thrust which now raged along the coast of North Africa until October 1942, was truly one of mobile operations and tank battles, but the seeming ability of Rommel, always to hold the initiative, turned not at all on the quality of his armour. The essential difference between the British and German forces lay in the superior tactical methods, highly effective anti-tank guns, and the manner in which the latter constantly employed the principle of all arms cooperation. This was best seen in the way in which Rommel rolled his anti-tank guns and 88mm flak guns into battle alongside his panzers. What very often appears to be nothing more than a disorganised mass of tanks, armoured cars, artillery pieces and half-tracks towing guns was in actuality a remarkably flexible instrument for fighting the types of battles characteristic of desert warfare. Training honed by experience allowed guns to be rapidly emplaced and employed to support a tank attack the panzers would deliberately hold back and allow the gun line of 50mm anti-tank guns and 88mm flax to take on the approaching British armour before launching their own armoured riposte. In such operations, the Panzer IV had no intrinsic advantage, being just one mobile element in the machine. For Rommel, North Africa was the theatre of operations, where the war took on its most modern shape. Here were fully motorised formations for whose employment the flat desert free of obstructions, offered hitherto unforeseen possibilities. Here only could the principles of motorised and tank warfare, as they'd been taught before 1939, be fully applied, and what was more important, developed. For the crews of the Mark IVs and other panzers, British armour, while badly led, was viewed with care. The heavy armour of the Matilda could only be defeated by Rommel's 88mm flat guns. And the Valentine, though poorly armed, nevertheless proved a difficult and elusive target. Shermans, Crusaders and Grants all caused problems. But until the arrival of the Tiger, the most powerful German tank was the Mark IV Special. Case Blue, the German summer offensive in southern Russia in 1942, saw the deployment in some numbers of the new Panzer IV F2, mounting the 75mm KWK cannon with a long barrel of 43 calibre length. This had been ordered by Hitler the previous November so as to give the Panzer IV a gun with the killing power to take on the T-34 and KV tanks. Compared with the low-velocity stub, the long barrel of the F-2 
had a muzzle velocity of 740 meters a second, enabling it to penetrate 82 millimeters of armor plate when angled at 30 degrees from the vertical. In March 1942, the Panzer IV production line at Krupps closed down to enable the tooling for the new gun to take place. By the time the summer offensive in Russia was underway, just under 250 had been produced, and while a few found their way to North Africa, the bulk were sent to Russia, giving the Panzer divisions there a welcome fillip. Nevertheless, newsreels of the period show that the Panzer III was still by far and away the more important tank. For although the Panzer IV was now being seen as the machine with greater development potential, this was not as yet reflected in the numbers being contracted for. As the Panzers fanned out across the broad steppe into the late summer of 1942, the German drive focused on a thrust into the Caucasus to capture the oil fields and a drive towards the Volga to capture the city of Stalingrad. The seeming lack of Soviet opposition had convinced Hitler that the Russian is finished. But unlike in 1941, Stalin had learned no longer to stand still and allow himself to be encircled by the wide-ranging panzer columns. As his troops withdrew in the face of the Axis advance, he gave the order that at Stalingrad he would retreat no further. Hitler's decision not to stand by his original planning and allow 4th Panzer Army to take Stalingrad but divert it southward toward Rostov denied the Germans the rapid coup that could have taken the city by midsummer. By the time Hitler realized his mistake and sent elements of 4th Panzer Army back towards Stalingrad to take the city, the Soviets had dug in, prepared to fight to the last. 6th Army under von Paulus was fighting in the approaches to the city by early August and had every reason to believe that the city would fall relatively easily. Elements of 4th Panzer Army, including these Panzer IV F2s from the 24th Panzer Division, found themselves fighting in the southern outskirts of the city. As Soviet resistance increased markedly, the Germans were forced by circumstance into using their invaluable armor in supporting their infantry in street battles, a form of fighting in which the Soviets were past masters and which tanks were totally unsuited for. As the fighting dragged on endlessly into the autumn, the seeds of German disaster at Stalingrad had truly been sown. Since the occupation, France had been employed by the Germans to rest and re-equip battered divisions from Russia. Seen here are brand new Panzer IV Gs issued to the 1st SS Division Leibstandarte Adolf Hitler. As part of his wide-ranging plan to destroy the whole of the German Southern Army Group, Stalin unleashed a series of other offensive in the wake of his encirclement of the 6th Army. By late January, Stalingrad already lay far in the rear of the advancing Soviet armies, and while doomed, even in its death throes, von Paula's 6th Army commanded the attentions of Soviet forces that would otherwise have been added to those pushing the German ever further westward. By February, the German position looked dire as the Soviets pushed them back to the start line of their 1942 offensive and beyond. When Kharkov was abandoned in defiance of his direct orders and the German retreat continued, Hitler flew to the headquarters of Field Marshal Erich von Manstein to demand his head. With Soviet forces a bare score miles away, he instead gave way to Manstein's arguments and gave him a free hand to unleash a counter-offensive against the now greatly overextended Soviet forces of the southwestern front. The cutting edge of his assembling force was the SS Panzer Corps, comprising of the 1st SS Panzer Grenadier Division, Leibstandarte Adolf Hitler, 2nd SS Panzer Grenadier Division, Das Reich, and 3rd SS Panzer Grenadier Division, Totenkopf. All three had returned to Russia after being rested and re-equipped in France. While the Soviets were not unaware of the redeployment of German forces and the concentration of their armor, overconfidence led them to interpret the moves as evidence of yet further German withdrawals. 
So, when on the morning of the 19th of February, Manstein unleashed the SS Panzer Corps in the first stage of his counter-offensive, the Russians were caught totally unprepared. Most noticeable in this footage is the shift in the makeup of the tank battalions employed by the SS to the Panzer IV in preference to the Panzer III. Indeed, February 1943 saw the last Panzer III's produced as battle tanks leave the production line in Germany. This event marking the final transition to the Panzer IV as the main battle tank in the German Army and Waffen SS. The Soviets were slow to wake up to the implications of the German counteroffensive. Between 4th and 6th of March, the German forces regrouped and then opened the second stage of their assault towards Kharkov. During the next five days, the SS troops advanced towards the city, all the while engaged in hard fighting against retreating Soviet troops. Following a rapid thaw which threatened to bring the offensive to a halt, the return of freezing temperatures allowed the advance to continue. Divisional 88mm flat guns now turned their attention on retreating Soviet columns heading for Kharkov. the afternoon of the 10th of March, the SS troops entered the outskirts of the city. Over the next few days, savage fighting occurred. Soviet troops, always at their best in such conditions, fought for every house and street, extracting a high price in casualties from the German attackers. No to the special tracks being employed by these Panzer IV Gs. A weakness of the Panzer IV in snowy conditions was its tendency to belly because of its poor weight distribution due to its narrow tracks. Extensions to the track to increase their width was an expedient designed to overcome this problem. The tracks were called Ostketten and did the job, although easily prone to damage and loss. It took five days of savage fighting for the SS troops to finally clear the city, the last remaining Soviet soldiers holding out in the tractor factory. 
A further advance by the armour north beyond Kharkov seized the town of Belgorod, but with the coming of the thaw, all further operations came to a halt in the face of General Mud. Following the invasion of North Africa by the Allies in November 1942, Hitler had ordered the rapid reinforcement by German forces of the Axis bridgehead in Tunisia. Forces denied to Rommel even now in full retreat westward towards Tunisia, and which may have turned the scales in the earlier desert battles, now poured into the bridgehead, including large numbers of tanks to form 5th Panzer Army. These Panzer 4Gs, belonging to the 10th Panzer Division, were employed in the offensive codenamed Operation Spring Breeze, launched on the 14th of February 1943 against the Americans in Sidi Puzaid. German success was transitory. The Tunisian bridgehead could not be sustained in the face of overwhelming Allied control of the air and sea lanes. By May, the Axis position had collapsed. Following the appointment of General Heinz Guderian as Inspector General of Panzer Troops in February 1943, with the brief from Hitler to completely rebuild the tank arm, his first concern was to scotch the notion advocated by certain ill-informed but influential high command generals to terminate Panzer IV production in favour of the new Tiger and Panther tanks. Such a move, he correctly observed, would have led to the early demise of the German army. In early 1943, the Panzer IV was the only tried and tested tank in production in Germany and was therefore the only candidate that could function as the mainstay of the Panzerwaffe. He also stressed the need for its production to actually be increased during the years 1944-45, so as to serve his expansion plans for the tank arm. In this, he was ably served by Albert Speer, Reich Minister for Armaments and War Production, who had been specifically charged by Hitler in January 43 to increase tank production even at the expense of other branches of the war industry. Speer had been working ever since his appointment the previous year to mobilize the slack in the German economy and increase war production by substantial margins. Frequent meetings of the sort seen in this footage was one of the means whereby he communicated targets and priorities. His task was not easy given the Byzantine nature of the Nazi system. Nevertheless, figures for the output of the Panzer IV give some idea of the strides that were being made. Whereas in January 41, 31 were produced. One year later, output had only risen to 58. But in January 1943, with the firms of Vomag, Nibelungenwerk, as well as the original company of Krupp Grusen involved in the program, production had risen to 168. In June and immediately preceding the offensive at Kursk, the numbers produced had risen yet again to 272. Output continued to climb and reached its peak in February 1945, when 485 Panzer IVs left the factories. In April 1943, the first Panzer IV Model H left the factories. This was the most numerous of all the subtypes, with some 3,774 being produced by the time it was phased out of production in favour of the Model J in June 1944. Although up-armoured and with a host of other changes, its most distinctive feature was the Schertzen, or armoured skirts, designed to give the Mark IV a measure of standoff protection against Soviet anti-tank rifles and Allied bazookas. These 5mm thick skirts were designed to deform and deflect the incoming shell, thus reducing its penetrative capabilities. While turret Schertzen were fixed, side skirts were removable. While the Battle of Kursk is certainly less well known than Stalingrad, it is nonetheless synonymous in the public mind with the German Tiger tank. In Soviet mythology, the Ishvestia headline, The Tigers Are Burning, has become the very symbol for the catastrophic German defeat in their last great offensive in the East. 
While prodigious efforts were made by the Germans to field 2,700 panzers and assault guns for their forlorn attempt to destroy the great Soviet salient at Kursk in July 1943, Nearly one-fifth of all armour available on the 30th of June as runners and non-runners to Army Group Centre and South comprised Panzer IVs. The 680 Panzer IVs included a small number of surviving stubs, with the bulk being made up of F2s and early Model Gs with the L43 cannon and later Model Gs and Hs with the L48 cannon. Nearly as many Panzer IIIs of all marks served in the offensive. But whereas Kursk represents the swan song of the career of the Panzer III as a battle tank, for it was no longer in production by June 1943, and the heavy losses in this battle led to it become a wasting asset. Thereafter, the numbers of Panzer IVs employed in Operation Citadel marks the point where the type has emerged to replace the very tank it was originally designed to support as the principal armoured fighting vehicle of the Panzer divisions. Following the appalling German tank losses at Kursk, which included many Panzer IVs, Guderian was later to observe that the armoured formations reformed and re-equipped with so much effort had lost heavily both in men and equipment and would now be unemployable for a long time to come. Kursk holds a significant place in Soviet accounts as the battle which broke the back of the Panzerwaffe in the east. In the aftermath of Citadel, the depleted Panzer divisions had to contend with a Red Army that had replenished its losses and gone over to the offensive. In this sequence, Panzer IVs of the SS Panzergrenadier Division, Das Reich, go into action in order to defeat a Soviet offensive on the Mias Front, designed to unhinge the German position to the south of Kharkov. While German success here gained a temporary respite, it could not alter the wider picture, and from the late summer of 1943, the Germans were in full retreat. In such circumstances, the work of the field tank repair workshops acquired even more significance. By this stage of the war, the Germans had an effective system for recovering damaged tanks from the battlefield. In this sequence, a Farmo 18-ton half-track with a 6-ton crane is being employed to remove the transmission and complete turret from a Panzer IV-H. This permitted fairly complex repairs to be carried out without the need to send the damaged unit back to Germany. Returning the turret to the hull required care to prevent damage to the turret ring and traversing mechanism. Close up of one of the eight bogies on the lower hull allows a clear view of the Mark IV's quarter elliptic suspension system. The prevalence of mine damage made the replacement of these units a frequent occurrence in Russia and North Africa. The external placement of the bogie unit did allow easy access when a replacement needed to be fitted. Under hull welding and an overhaul of the cooling fans on the engine deck precedes a final spray of the Panzer with the dark yellow colour used as a base coat on all Panzers from February 1943. The spray here is quite random and the overhaul Panzer reveals a paint finish in which the contrasting olive green and red brown have been added to the vehicle with broad strokes from the large brushes. In the late summer and early autumn of 1943, Panzer IVs were engaged in heavy fighting during the retreat westward to the line of the Dnieper. It is still possible, even at this stage of the war, to distinguish from among the shirts and decked Panzer IVs the occasional survivor mounting the short-barreled 75mm gun and still being employed in its original role as a support tank. Unlike their commanders, Panzer drivers rarely gained the limelight of publicity, but in September 1943, Hans Thaler, an Unterscharfuhrer in the 2nd SS Panzer Division Das Reich, was awarded the Knight's Cross for outstanding courage. Having destroyed three T-34s, his own tank was hit. Although his tank commander ordered the crew to bail out, Thaler remained and, under fire, jury rigged the steering and got the Mark IV-G underway. In the following 30 minutes, his Panzer dispatched a further seven Soviet tanks. Caught by a cameraman through a driver's visor is a Panzer IV-H with carefully sprayed camouflage on its shirtson belonging to the 2nd Panzer Division moving forward slowly to engage a T-34 which is shown shortly thereafter on fire. 
The step provided on a clear day when the heat haze and the high summer temperatures was not too great, almost optimum conditions for visibility. German optics, which were of a higher standard and sophistication than those of the Red Army, thus allowed German tank commanders the advantage when it came to the first shot. Until the introduction of the T-34-85 in early 1944, the T-34, notwithstanding its inherent virtues, did suffer from a two-man turret in which the tank commander had to double up as loader. This high workload lessened its combat efficiency. With a three-man turret crew, the Panzer IV was more efficient and the workload for each crewman reduced. Nevertheless, by autumn, the Wehrmacht on the Eastern Front, having lost immense ground to the Red Army in the months after Kursk, could expect no respite, for with the winter came the expectation of new Soviet offensives. Following his appointment as Supreme Commander in Greece, Field Marshal Erwin Rommel had flown to Salonika on July the 5th, 1943, to inspect the defences. Hitler had bitten on the Allied deception that they intended to make landings there and had also dispatched the 1st Panzer Division to the country as a reinforcement. The Allied intention had been to get Hitler to divert forces away from Italy where the real invasion was to take place. The Panzer IVs in this sequence are all late model Gs and are finished in overall dark yellow. Each carries the six smoke grenade tubes found on this model. It's not surprising that the crews look relieved to get into the sea. With outside temperatures in the high 90s, the interior temperature for the crew of five was in excess of 100 degrees. Assuming that it was only a matter of time before Italy sought peace terms from the Allies, Hitler laid contingency plans for the occupation of the country. Following the announcement on the 8th of September, the code word Axis was flashed to Field Marshals Rommel and Kesselring, who dispatched forces into northern Italy by way of the Brenner Pass and the rail system. While the newsreel implied that the progress of the Army and SS troops into Italy was warmly supported by the natives, the arrival of such a large body of German troops must mean that Italy itself would now become a theatre of war as the Germans contested the Allied landings and their subsequent advance up the peninsula. intended originally to transfer the whole of the SS Panzer Corps to Italy after Kursk, the dire situation in Russia saw only the Leibstandarte withdrawn to arrive in Milan where the presence of their Panzer IVs was deemed necessary to help the inhabitants remain loyal to the fascist cause. Italy was not a country whose geography was conducive to armoured warfare. Consequently, the number of Panzer divisions deployed there varied from one to a maximum of just three. Far better use was made of assault guns and self-propelled weapons which could take better advantage of the restricted terrain. These Panzer IV Hs belonged to the 15th Panzer Division which served in the peninsula. In Russia the bitter fighting continued into and throughout the winter. Soviet resources were now so overwhelming that the Red Army could maintain its offensive posture whatever the season. These Mark IVs are involved in heavy fighting with Army Group North in the late winter of 43-44. It was the deep snow of the Russian winter and the ease with which the German tanks bellied, because of the narrowness of their tracks, that led to the development of Ostketten, seen here on a Panzer IV-G. In cooperation with an assault gun detachment, the Panzer IVs are observed in the distance, opening fire and attacking a Soviet armoured spearhead. An observer is seen to be calling an artillery position from where a battery of 150mm guns opens fire on the distant Russians. The military disasters and bad news from the Eastern Front during the winter of 1943-44 is reflected in the paucity of film to be found on the newsreels, so that when an operational victory was secured, much was made of it. 
Such was the occasion when cameramen took part in the armoured assault that led to the breakthrough into the town of Kovel in the northern Ukraine, where a battle group under the command of SS Gruppenführer Herbert Giller had been encircled by the Soviets in mid-March 1944. Although a small detachment of the Panthers from SS Viking had broken through to strengthen the garrison some days earlier, the main relief attack did not go in until the beginning of April. Elements of 4th Panzer Division under the command of Oberst Hoffmann and units from SS Viking broke through to the town via the road running from Brest-Litovsk. Among the Soviet armour destroyed were a number of Lend-Leased M4A2 Shermans, that begin to appear in ever-increasing numbers on German footage from this front during 1944. Ad hoc armoured battle groups composed of tanks and self-propelled weapons from mixed units were a frequent response to contingencies on the Eastern Front, where Soviet armoured breakthroughs along the overstretched German lines required prompt action of a sort that could be given only by mobile troops. Actions of this sort serve to demonstrate that in spite of the overwhelming material superiority of the Red Army, German tankers retained a proficiency in the handling of their panzers that they were to keep until Germany's defeat. Troops of the Hungarian army no longer played a frontline role on the Eastern Front in early 1944, their activities being confined to the rear areas, albeit under German command. Nevertheless, Goebbels' propaganda department still went out of its way to depict the relationship between the two states as strong and based upon a firm and continuing commitment to the anti-Bolshevik crusade. When opportunity provided itself, they would film examples of such for the German cinema audiences as in this case where an honour guard provided by a Panzer IV unit has been drawn up to enable a formal presentation of the Iron Cross to be made to two Hungarian officers. The Panzer IVs are late model H's and carry the Zimmerit anti-magnetic mine pace on their vertical surfaces. As if to complement the almost tangible expectation felt in Germany concerning the inevitability of the Allied invasion of Europe in the early summer of 1944, German newsreel audiences were regaled with long and detailed features showing the strength of the defences on the Atlantic Wall and of the power of the forces assembled in France to defeat it. Most of the static defences containing the heavy gun batteries, whilst outwardly impressive, were emplaced along the Pas de Calais and in the sector of the German 15th Army, which extended from Belgium to the River Somme, and within which most senior German officers believed the landings would take place. A masterful Allied deception plan which reinforced the Germans in this conviction continued throughout June and into July and led many to believe that the landings in Normandy were but the prelude to the main ones to come in that sector. As part of his massive programme of building shore defences, Rommel even went so far as to open the dikes and flood the coastal strip in Holland. German armoured strength was always recognised as being the key to defeating the Allied landings. On the 1st of June, no fewer than 700 Panzer IVs were on strength in France. The panzer units, as well as the infantry, were exercised in the period before the storm broke so as to hone up their fighting skills. But the resources available to the Germans were at best too thinly spread and in many cases in the wrong place. Cameramen were on hand to record Field Marshal Gerd von Rundstedt when he inspected the newly raised, trained and equipped 12th SS Panzer Division Hitler Jugend just prior to D-Day. In addition to its 48 Panthers, Hitler Jugend could field no fewer than 91 Panzer IVs and in the days to come the reputation of this newest Waffen SS Panzer Division would become notorious. How best employ the Panzer Divisions come the invasion was an issue that caused great strife among the high command in the West. Rommel was adamant that they had to be sighted sufficiently far forward that they could attack the landing beaches as soon as the Allies came ashore. He was of the opinion, based upon prior experiences, that unless Dunkirk within 24 hours, the Allied landings must succeed. 
The reality of overwhelming Allied air power, he believed, rendered the view of Geo von Schweppenberg, command the Panzer Group West, to await the landings and then employ his Panzer divisions to smash the subsequent Allied drive out of the bridgehead, as misconstrued. The matter had not been resolved to anyone's satisfaction, even as the Allied invasion was underway. When finally they did come on June the 6th, 1944, the German forces in northern France were caught totally unprepared. With Rommel away in Germany, any hope of the rapid release of Panzer divisions to assail the Allied landing beaches within hours of their coming ashore came to naught. Although there was an ineffectual attack by 21st Panzer on the 6th, it was only on the following day when 12th SS Panzer arrived on the scene that a determined attack was launched by the Germans. Only the Panzer IV Battalion had arrived at Caen during the night of 6th, 7th of June, the Panther Battalion being delayed due to the ever-present attentions of Allied aircraft. Nevertheless, the decision was made to go ahead and attack. The orders given by the divisional commander, Brigade Führer Fritz Witt, were quite clear. The Panzer IV Battalion was to attack the enemy along the line of the Caen luc sur mer railway line and drive him into the sea. Although the attack was scheduled for 1600 hours, the Germans were preempted by the advance of the Canadian 3rd Division towards Caen, where they'd been tasked with seizing and holding the airfield. Four Mark IVs on reconnaissance were intercepted by Shermans and three of the German tanks rapidly knocked out. At this, Obersturmbannführer Max Wunsch brought forward the time of the German attack and ordered all panzers to move forward against the enemy immediately. The combat footage to be seen here was shot during this battle and is some of the best taken from the late war period of Panzer IVs in action. Although some 50 Panzer IVs were deployed by Hitler Jugend for this attack, the camera has caught the action of just the 5th and 6th companies as they struck against the Canadian flank. Although the 6th Company knocked out more than 10 tanks, they in turn lost five of their Panzer IVs to Canadian fire. Subsequently, the Mark IVs of the 6th Company continued their advance across the rolling terrain, but then came under fire from a gun line of hidden Canadian 6-pounder anti-tank guns. Five Panzer IVs were hit and destroyed. By the end of the day, the tally stood at 14 Panzer IVs lost against 27 Canadian tanks destroyed. Although the footage is supported by strident and triumphalist music, implying that the young soldiers of the SS had achieved a great victory, in reality the possibility of the Germans destroying the Allied lodgment had gone. The attack by Hitler Jugend was called off as night fell. The 7th was just the first day of combat in what was to become two months of hard and vicious fighting, by the end of which the division had all but ceased to exist. Strength returns for the division on August the 25th reported that just 10 tanks had survived the battle for Normandy. In den kleinen Küstenorten toben erbitterte Straßenkämpfe. Footage of Panzer IVs in action in the Normandy campaign is very limited, surprising given that it was the most numerous German tank to see action there. Very few Panzers survived the Normandy campaign. Major losses of Panzer IVs on the eastern and western fronts in the latter part of 1944 saw a massive drop in the numbers available for combat. This is mirrored in the numbers employed in the Battle of the Bulge. Although Hitler had ordered the careful husbanding of Panzer strength in preparation for Operation Autumn Mist, only 259 were available out of a total armoured strength of nearly 1,750 tanks and assault guns committed to the offensive. Even though 1,110 Mark IVs had been built from October through to December, the answer lies in an average monthly loss rate of Panzers at this stage of the war of nearly 700 machines per month. The Panzer IV was not only the most numerous German tank at this stage of the war, it was also the most vulnerable. These twin factors providing the most likely explanation for the relative decline in the availability of the Panzer Mark IV. By the late summer of 1944, the Red Army had virtually destroyed Army Group Center and reached the borders of Poland. 
Panzer IVs lined up along one side of the road are now moving forward to join combat with the enemy. When combat is joined, the Soviet tanks that the guns of the Mark IVs have destroyed are moored Lendley Shermans. One of the more remarkable contrasts between the war fought in the East when compared to the West is the much lesser role played by air power in the former than in the latter. German newsreels show the rapid shifting of armoured units by rail from one threatened sector to another on the Eastern Front in a manner that was not possible in the West. The near absence of foliage or any attempt to give cover to the panzers implies that the primary threat to the survival of a Panzer IV crew came not from the Red Air Force but from the seemingly inexhaustible numbers of Soviet tanks. This sequence in East Prussia in late 1944 allows us to view the final model of the Panzer IV in action. The more obvious changes that can be seen are the new exhaust system and the employment of mesh instead of the standard metal Schertzen. Panzer IVs fought against the Red Army until Germany's defeat in May 1945. In some of the last footage ever shot by the propaganda cameraman, a battle group which includes at least one Panzer IV has dispatched a late model IS-2 and an Su-100 in fighting on the Oder. The battle history of the Panzer IV, the only tank to have remained in service and production for the duration of the Second World War, did not, however, end with it. The final shots ever fired by Panzer IVs were those in service with the Syrian army and employed by them to fire on Israeli settlements from positions atop the Golan Heights in the mid-1960s. Their final reckoning came in June 1967 when the Israeli army stormed the heights and captured them. Some stand there still in mute testimony to the 7,350 Panzer IVs of all versions built between 1938 and 1945.